3D Lab guest sessions are online technical talks or collaborative workshops with external practitioners or our in-house technical team. These sessions are hosted by the 3D Lab based at Wimbledon College of Arts, UAL. We seek conversations that reflect the richness of thinking through making, technical research and development, and practical learning and teaching. We aim to explore the making literacies that underpin making practice, and in doing so develop a learning resource within the context of performance and beyond. For previous sessions and to join our mailing list, please visit wca3dlab.myblog.arts.ac.uk. It's great to have you guys back in the room. We know it's quite a busy time of year, but we're happy to be recording this for our archive as well uh, for you to watch back when you need. Guest sessions are an opportunity to really look at uh, the technical research or making principles behind um, lots of different practices. And we're very privileged to have Bonnie Hayward with us. He's actually at Wimbledon alumni. He's been working on a big, intricate project that is UK wild uh, at the minute with Wildfowl and Wetland Trust. And the project's called Generation Wild. So he'll take us through some of the ins and outs of that, which I think will speak into a lot of um, disciplines that we teach uh, at Wimbledon, but also uh, more broadly than that, if you're joining us from um, out, uh, outside of CCW initially. Bonnie's also the co-artistic director of uh, interactive design studio Stand and Stare. And if you haven't yet, please check out their website, which is standandstare.com or their Instagram at stand underscore underscore. I should imagine, and, and underscore, underscore, stare. So uh, you get those lovely uh, reflective gaps in between them. Uh, so do check out uh, those websites uh, or the Instagram to find out more about uh, the different uh, projects that uh, San and Say have been involved in. But we've got the pleasure of having Barney in the room today um, and will potentially show us or reveal to us a little bit of his trajectory of his practice over the years since leaving Wimbledon. Uh, to now his work that has led him to all these kind of quite interesting places, uh, including a starting point in immersive theatre environments. Um, so I think I'll hand over to you, Bonnie, and then we'll um, uh, give you as much time as you need. Hopefully you can all see and hear. Um, so yeah, um, my name is Barney. Um, I'm, as Ash said, I'm the co-artistic director of Stand and Stare. Um, today, I'll give a bit of a background about where Stand and St how Stand and Stare started, um, kind of where we came from, and then I'll move on to talking about um, the Generation Wild project um, and kind of dip into some of the um, the detail of the kind of uh, different aspects within that. Um, so um, the company Stand and Stare was founded by myself and my sister Lucy Telling, um, which was over 10 years ago. Um, uh, we started just uh, just after I finished at Wimbledon, um, where I, I studied uh, fine art sculpture, um, and kind of the, the following year we, we worked, me and Lucy worked on, on the kind of first collaboration together. Um, so I'll just show you some images um, of some kind of early performance work that we did. So um, we began doing interactive and immersive theatre um, and uh, here you can see so in the bottom left hand corner and um, this was a, um, an, a cheese and wine tasting with a theatrical narrative which was a, a touring production that we um, took around the country and up to the Edinburgh Festival and um, the one on the other side was a a series of little performances that we did in the back of cars and um, the one at the top there with the stilts and the balloon that was the very first one that we did um, stand and stare which um, so these kind of these performances ranged from kind of quite large scale things to then very sort of small intimate one-on-one -on -one experiences and um, as we prog progressed we kind of got more and more interested in the role that technology could play in what we were doing um, and I guess for, for myself and Lucy, neither of us um, are performers, and so that that aspect of the work was kind of, I guess, less appealing to us. And so, but the narrative and the design and all of those other elements were things that we were really interested in. And the kind of the idea of research and um, and uh, using things like archives as inspiration. Um, so that kind of led us on to thinking about more and more about 
um, how technology could be used to kind of do some different things with uh, what we'd been experimenting with in performance. Um, so that led us to the Pervasive Media Studio in Bristol, which is, um, is in the watershed, which is a, an art centre and cinema. Um, and it's a, a studio that's supported both by the watershed um, and the University of Bristol and the University of the West of England. And it's a, um, a kind of creative space where academics and artists and technologists kind of get together and share ideas um, and they provide various different opportunities through project funding and mentoring and support that um, seem like a, a, a kind of perfect place for us to begin to kind of think about how we might do things a bit differently. Um, and so we, we, were, we were able to get onto residency there and um, where we had a bit of time and some money to develop um, a concept that we'd, we'd come up with. Um, and so the, it was here that we then uh, developed uh, the theatre jukebox um, and that was a, a concept that initially came out of a, a box of family records that we had which we wanted to um, which we wanted to do something interesting with but we weren't quite sure how to kind of present that um, and so um, in this situation what we did was to um, divide up the material into lots of different segments and then we um, we assigned those to um, projections of visuals and then we made audio recordings to accompany that and devised um, this kind of concept which was the, the jukebox concept where you basically sit at a table um, and you have a series of postcards in front of you and then when you place a postcard onto the table in front of you recognizes which one you've chosen and then projects um, images that, that are, are mapped and interact with that physical card um, and then you hear audio through headphones um, and so it was a way of kind of presenting a, a non-linear narrative in a similar way to what we had been doing with um, immersive theatre um, that felt like um, once we'd finished this this kind of personal project that it was it was a platform that could be used for presenting other stories and working with other material um, but essentially using um, this kind of these uh, this concept of the postcards and the projections and the audio um, in combination um, so then that has kind of over the years has led on to uh, lots of different projects which in in some ways have been kind of inspired by that first um, theatre jukebox idea so um, the for example the one at the bottom in, in the middle there with the triangle that was um, an exhibition that we did for the Royal Shakespeare Company um, and that was looking at their um, props department so rather than being postcards um, in this in this situation we and presented um, props that had been used in productions and put them in archive boxes um, and then visitors to this exhibition could choose a choose a box carry it over to a big table in the middle and then projections would be mapped to the table and then audio um, within the room um, and so that was a kind of a way of bringing these objects to life and um, showing things sometimes things that um, were more precious so if there were archive material or there were items that they didn't want the public to handle through the kind of projection mapping we were able to present that in a kind of um, dynamic and interesting way um, you can see some of the other images some of some of these are kind of using projection and audio some of them um, just audio on on their own the, the little one next to it was a project that we did for care homes in Corby um, and that was something that was a just a, a portable unit that could be taken around different homes and was exploring when you place the drawer on the top it would play recordings that were made from uh, local people about memories from the place and then within the drawers there are um, objects and um, tactile things that um, that people could engage with to trigger to trigger memories uh, particularly people were live, living with dementia um, and Alzheimer's um, so moving on from the kind of theatre jukebox um, uh, projects which um, is something that's still very much 
um, part of our work today um, and each each one we approach um, as a as a new concept um, but using some of these kind of similar techniques that we've developed over the years um, another sort of strand of our work that we've um, developed over the last probably five years now is um, is uh, creating apps um, and I guess our sort of focus with that is um, in the same way as with the with the jukebox project there's a kind of interest we have in the relationship between um, physical tile objects and digital experiences and the um, the relationship that those two things have and so that kind of continues into our app design um, this is a, a, a product that we um, designed and we sell through a, a separate website Mayfly Sound um, and the way that this works is that you have an app where you can make sound recordings and then you can connect those recordings to um, physical illustrations printed in our jotters and journals or on the stickers that can be stuck into your own notebook so the, the idea is that you can um, link a physical notebook where you might make drawings or jottings or um, collect tickets or receipts um, and then you can link that to a digital recording and um, this yeah this kind of evolves out of the idea of um, a, of a travel journal and being able to kind of document a, a trip um, both sort of in a more traditional way but also through kind of audio and sound recordings um, and there are a number of other apps and things that we've we've kind of developed um, since this um, which I won't talk um, any more about today because I'll now move on to the Generation Wild project. Um, so with this project um, it feels like it's kind of it's quite a nice one because it crosses a lot of the different boundaries um, and different things that we've done over the years so there are elements of performance in there there's also the kind of um, creative tech stuff um, and then also workshops and um, kind of educational stuff that um, feels like they're all different th things that we've done in sort of different ways and this project kind of um, encapsulates a lot of those things and and also is on a kind of a scale that we've not worked on before so for us it's it's really exciting um, and I'll I'll kind of talk you through some of the aspects of it um, it's also sort of worth remembering that it's not finished yet so um, the the launch date is in September and so some of the things some of the images that I've got today they might change um, they're not necessarily like the the images they're they're just taken um as we've been kind of going along um but it will yeah i guess it gives you an idea of something that's kind of happening in the moment um so uh next slide um so in terms of the the kind of overview of the project um uh, it was a commission from the wild fowl and wetland trust who have uh, 10 different sites around the country um, and seven of those sites uh, will be will be delivering this experience to um, so essentially that's the the same idea but um, repeated um, so each asset that I'm talking about we're, we're making kind of multiples of seven of them um, and the the kind of concept for it is that it's to um, engage children from disadvantaged backgrounds and their families um, through an in-depth story that will take place across the seven different sites um, and then it will continue when they get home and at school um, and the idea is is to try to instill a love of nature and the natural world that kind of goes beyond just a one-off visit so um, they do have a visit but then afterwards there are lots of things that they can kind of engage with to hopefully um, to make make interacting with the natural world something that's more um, more routine and familiar um, so that's kind of at, at the heart of the whole project um, so uh, what I'll do now is I'll just sort of run through kind of what the shape of the experience looks like 
um, and then I'll dip into a few more um, a few more kind of talk through the detail of some of it, some of the different aspects of it. Um, so the experience begins in school with a with a picture book, um, and this these are a couple of the pages from the picture book, um, and this is read to a, a, a primary school class, um, and they're basically interest in they're introduced to this character Ava, who is born as a an osprey chick. Um, and she finds this giant nest and decides to fly down into it um, and then something magical happens and she turns into this um, hybrid girl but part bird, uh, bird part girl um, and that's where we're left that's the end of the, the picture book and that's the end of the story and so it's to kind of get the kids interested they sort of know who this character is but they don't really know much about it um, the next part of the experience is a school visit. So um, the, the class of probably 30 kids would then um, go on a coach to the nearest uh, wetland centre um, and they wouldn't necessarily be told that it was connected to the picture book. That would be kind of, um, they would probably remember it, but not necessarily, there's not an obvious link made. Um, and so they begin, uh, um, their kind of introduction and they're welcomed when they get to the wetland centre and as they're walking around they then stumble on this giant nest um, and they meet the character of Ava who is then played by a puppet um, which is operated by one of the learning managers um, and so at that point there is a, um, a short performance um, where they uh, they hear from Ava and they hear about her struggle that she she doesn't really know who she is and she doesn't know um, what she's supposed to do. So she asks the kids if they can help her by talking to some of the creatures that live on the wet, within the wetland centre. Um, and so in order for the for the children to be able to communicate and understand the creatures, she's made um, what she's called translator phones, which are these, um, you can see in the, in the middle picture, um, they are little baskets that can be, um, when they're uh, tapped on these listening posts, which represent the different creatures, um, they, it plays back um, a piece of audio that um, is as if they're listening to one of the creatures. Um, so they go around um, in, in small groups, the children um, finding the listening posts and listening to the creatures. And then also on the posts, there are nature activities, which they then undertake um, in order to prove that their, um, their, their love of nature and their kind of interest in helping the character of Ava. Um, and so they learn a few things on the on the trail and then they come back at the end of their visit to see her again um, and they tell her that she is an osprey and the ospreys migrate um, and that in order for her to find out more about herself and to hopefully find her family again that they um, that she will need to migrate and, and fly south to West Africa so they um, with with the children's help they teach her to fly and she takes off and leaves the nest um, and that's kind of where the where the school visit ends so they've they've met the character they've been around the site they've done some nature activities and then they've they've let her go but um, without quite knowing where she's going or what happens next in the story um, so then the next part of the experience um, is a, a website that they can log on to when they get home or back to school, um, which essentially charts her journey. So you, um, as she, over the coming weeks, um, you, they will receive bulletin updates from her, which are audio recordings um, and photographs that she's sent. Um, along her journey so you can um, chart her as she flies down through France and Spain and into North Africa and across the Sahara um, and kind of check in and keep up to date with what she's doing 
Um, and also as part of the website, there are lots of nature activities that are similar to the ones they did on site, but there are, are loads more of them. Um, and in order to help Ava, the kids can do these nature activities, um, which gives her kind of um, energy and gives her the sort of uh, morale boost to continue on her on her journey. Um, also, if they do a certain number of these nature activities, they can become uh, what's called a guardian of the wild um, and they become they um, they will get like a badge and a certificate um, at the end of the journey if they can sort of prove that they've they've engaged with nature throughout that. Um, so that's something that then happens. Yeah, whilst they're at home and at school. Um, and they can they can do that as much or as little as they want to. Um, but our hope is that um, they will once they get into it, they'll be they'll want to continue and they'll be engaged by by the story and the unfolding narrative. Um, so then the next element of the experience is for each child that goes on the school visit, they'll also receive a free family ticket. Um, which will allow them to um, go back with their whole family um, and visit the centre again. Um, and this time there is a different trail with the same posts, but with different audio that they can then go around and they can find all the different listening posts um, and hear from the animals again. Um, and so the idea of this is to get the families engaged in, in the story and the experience, but also um, in the natural world. Um, and um, for people who obviously the, the, um, the cost of taking your family to one of these weapon centres is kind of out of reach for some people. So the hope is that by providing a free ticket for the family, that gives them the opportunity to do those things. Um, so that's kind of the, um, that's the sort of the, the shape of the experience. Um, I'll now just kind of uh, talk a little bit about initially um, the nest and how we designed that and the thinking behind it. Um, and then I'll talk about a bit about the translator phones and the listening posts. Um, so here is just an image of um, some of the inspiration we were looking at um, potential nests that we could design and make. Um, for this, there was quite a lot of different things to consider. Um, primarily, it was a, a performance space, so it was where the puppet would be would be during um, the two sections. But it also um, was would be something that's permanently installed on site, and so any member of the public would be able to um, interact with it. Um, and so it needed to be something that is is safe um, and durable, um, as well as exciting and um, and a kind of I guess what we wanted to make sure of within the experience was that it was a, a memorable kind of it, uh, element to it that would hopefully kind of stick in the mind of the of the children um, experiencing the performance. But but it also doubles as a kind of asset for for the wetland centres um, where even if people don't know about this story and the narrative, it's, a, um, it's an interesting object that they can have their photo taken in or sit inside. Um, so yeah, we, um, we kind of looked at various different options, um, also having to kind of consider uh, the health and safety uh, risks involved with that and making sure that um, yeah, it was going to it was going to last for the for at least three years, um, which is the length of the the project. Um, so here is just some um, some of the scale drawings that we put together to show how it would be constructed and built. And these kind of went through various stages as we were kind of developing um, how to make it um, and what materials we would use. Um, essentially. Uh, the design that we went for has a, a steel basket, which forms the kind of the base of it, which are then is then kind of dressed with um, coppice wood to give it the 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 effect of a of a nest. Um, here's a, an image just of working out some of the kind of the detail of it. So this is how the nest would be fixed to the floor so that it doesn't rock or move. Um, 
all of these things had to be obviously worked out and designed before we built anything and um, so we had to have sign off from from the um from wwt and their kind of health and safety team so um it was yeah drilling into kind of every little minute detail um uh, before we could kind of move on to the next stage of of actually of building it um so the next images these are um of the fabrication itself so um you can see the kind of the, the coppice um in its kind of raw form and then the the rings that would then be welded together to make the basket shape and then the sort of middle one on the bottom is kind of as that wood was being built up um to then create a kind of a nest like structure um we were kind of we were really keen to make sure that it felt like it was a natural um object rather than it being feeling like a kind of a piece of play equipment um, and so it was sort of getting that balance between um, the look of it and and the durability of it um, these next images just show the installation of the first one at slimbridge um, that's aaron at the end there who um who who made it um, and yeah so now we've got we've installed one at slimbridge and one in london um, so we've got five more to go over the, which yeah, we'll be doing over the summer. Um, so now I'll just talk um, a little bit about the translator phones and the listening posts. Um, so yeah, the way these work, the the translator phone itself is a is a basket with some tech technology inside. Um, so there's a, a speaker. Um, and what's called an RFID reader, which is similar to what you'd find in a, with a, like an Oyster card or contactless payment. Um, and then on the post itself is then an RFID tag. Um, and part of the reason for sort of doing it in this way was because often you get listening posts where the, the speaker and the tech essentially is installed in the post, which means it has to be really durable because it, lives outside um all year whereas with this um the only actual piece of tech that needs to be um durable is the rfid tag um and then the more delicate equipment um that can be stored safely inside um so although the the baskets need to be strong and durable it's a it's a kind of an an easier or a, a, a less kind of risky route in terms of things getting broken along the way so i guess in terms of that's one of the things that we kind of often have to think about is um designing a kind of a piece of tech like this is how does it um how do we make sure that it's gonna gonna work and last for the length of time that it needs to um, and also that it's something that for the staff isn't going to be too complicated um, so the um the tech itself this is the sort of first prototype that we put together which is just kind of the different components um put together as quickly as possible um and this was so that we could uh we could experiment with how it would work um and to see if this was going to be the right solution for us before we kind of went any further so um this is a kind of a process that we would go through when as kind of as early as possible um to see um how things work um what needs to be changed um and yeah this luckily the the sort of the concept of the design seemed to be the right one and so we we then refined that and um here are some more scale drawings that just show the sort of the process of how similar to the ones with the nest how it would actually be put together um, and all this again had to be thought about and designed before we'd kind of were able to then commit to the sort of um, production of them so at the moment we're making 110 of these which will then be distributed around the different um the seven different sites um, the here is a here's a um just an image of the kind of the 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 finished um setup inside so that's um 
in that plastic box is where all of the more delicate um, items are and the idea of putting it in the box is to protect it and to have have a sort of another layer of kind of protection if it gets dropped or um, if it gets uh, wet um, and then the, this is just the, the base plate so if you turn it upside down that's what you would see um, and then here is just some of the listening posts so these are ones that are dotted around um, Slimbridge um, they will obviously depend um, on a, in each of the different sites. They'll be the same content, but they'll be um, positioned differently, and the the routes themselves might be um, might be changed um, depending on kind of the location and, and what works best. Um, so although we're kind of replicating the the experience um, in each of these different places, they they all require a little bit of um, of adapting to fit and to work within the sort of specific environment um, that they'll be going into. Um, this was just um, kind of a, uh, I guess, thinking a little bit about the um, the logistics of um, how to manage the the group of. So for this is for the school group, um, and interestingly, this is sort of something that. Um, kind of reminded us of when we were making immersive theatre back in the sort of early days of um, people management is how do you get x number of people to to do what you want them to do but in a way that feels really easy and uncomplicated and um, it's sort of one of those things where if you get it right nobody really notices that anything has been done but if it goes wrong then it can be all the work that you've done um, for everything else can kind of be lost because people are not sure where they're supposed to be going or the timing doesn't work. So this was just trying to sort of visualize uh, how you get 30 kids. So you break them down into groups of five. So each group of five has a translator phone and a map. Um, and then on the next slide, these are the kind of trails. So essentially there are there are nine different listening posts um, each group would go to within their own trail would only go to three different listening posts um, and within each route there would be two different groups kind of rotating um, so hopefully they don't end up kind of on top of each other um, and so this kind of planning then feeds in fed into the the narrative and the way that those pieces of audio were written so rather than having nine completely separate um, pieces of audio, there are kind of essentially three sets that say similar things, but in different ways. Um, so, yeah, it's just, I guess, kind of um, realising how the logistics then impact on the um, on the kind of creative aspect of it and how you have to kind of be aware of one in order to um, to do the other um, and then this is just yeah a, a, a map of the kind of um, this is a map of Slimbridge and so this is what uh, the groups would be given in order to find where they need to go um, so it's obviously there's a certain kind of there's an amount of effort that needs to go in in terms of map reading um, but what we realized is that that's for some of the kids that's something that they really got into um, we did some user testing um, at Slimbridge with a number of different schools um, and it was a really important thing to do in terms of working out what bits work and what bits don't and and from that we've kind of made lots of changes um, and alterations that will then hopefully make it it run smoother when when we launch in September. Um, so this yeah this hopefully will will be a, a guide for them to kind of find their find their routes and navigate where they need to go. Um, so I've kind of there are although there are lots of other elements to the project. Um, so there's the the puppet and there's the sound design and all the um, the scripts and things. I'm going to leave it there um, because I think 
it would be good to kind of leave some space if people had any questions or they want to find anything else out about different parts of the project but um yeah so i'll um pop it onto the the last slide and um hand it back over to ash oh barney that is amazing thank you so much it's just so wonderful to see actually just unpack a project for all its value um, and I'm just sitting here writing so much in terms of if we're thinking about making literacy and making uh, or realizing things, um, there's so many different aspects that you've covered there and so interesting as part of, you know, one studio kind of really being responsible for shaping and molding that project and, and the detail is phenomenal. Uh, so it's so such a blessing to kind of get a little bit of an insight into uh, a live project that um, has included a lot of um, aspects really. Um, uh, Chris in the chat has just asked how many people were involved do, do you think all in all? Um, so I guess yeah there's lots of different people I mean we as a as a kind of company I think have, have probably employed about 20 freelancers so um there's a the core team is three of us so it's myself and lucy and um, debs um who are kind of doing a lot of the project management and then there are lots of so there are aaron who's the fabricator who made the nest um and then various other people who've done the different um, elements of it and some of those are people that we've worked with loads before and other people like the puppet maker who we've not we've not worked with puppets in the past so that was a new kind of relationship that we had to make um but i think i think it was probably in the region of about 20 different people with all the different voiceover artists and things and the um sound design and um but then on top of that there's then the organization so um wwt have uh, in each of the sites there are learning managers there are all sorts of people that we've then been having to kind of communicate with so um i couldn't give you kind of an exact number but um yeah lo lots of people and then also just thinking um in our uh, chat last week we were mentioning just even in the prep of going live like um all the teaching and learning and working with educators in schools and get that onboarding people in terms of you know because uh, really you're not now i guess responsible for this project to keep going you've kind of empowered and enabled uh, wwt and the schools involved to kind of run with the project so there's some you know it's just phenomenal clarity in in terms of being able almost to hand over a project and allow that to kind of run as it were so you also mentioned about maybe uh maybe you could share a little bit about uh your research into uh, or contacting diversity consultants as well just to kind of really share <laughs> the yeah uh, the expansion of you know the thought process and the design process that, that has gone into it yeah i suppose sort of just i guess initially touching on the sort of educational stuff and how we've worked with so we there's at the beginning of the project we um identified a number of different schools that we would work with through the user testing and those have been the same teachers who we've kind of gone to with the very earliest ideas and then have been able to sort of go back to and that's been a really important part of the process because they've been sort of part of that journey and have felt like they can shape it um we're not in school every day with kids and so there are things that we would have missed or not considered um so that was a really key thing to do and also slightly tricky with all of the, the lockdown and schools not being all, all of that having to be done remotely mm -hmm. um but we had various sort of zoom sessions with different um parents and teachers and children um to do that and then i guess that thing you're talking about of handing over something and um it's sort of there is a thing to do with i guess collaborating with a an, another organization at, and at what point you you kind of it's almost like you're handing over your baby that you've kind of crafted and you've made it but you're also aware that that they have to own it uh, ultimately and that for the the learning managers and um there's a, a project manager that will be kind of running the project for the next three years and sort of 
we're at the point now of kind of having to go this is how we would do it but you also need to work out how you want to do it um so that um it feels like it belongs to them um and that they can kind of take it forwards with confidence and and know exactly how to sort of where how far they can push it i suppose before it sort of starts to then not look like the thing that we've designed um and then i guess yeah the the other point you made about the sort of diversity we've um we've worked with a number of different diversity consultants on it um which has been a really kind of a really interesting um, and sometimes sort of challenging process to kind of work out how you design something and it, and it, I think lots of learning has happened in that we've kind of there are elements of the project where we've done things and we've got it to a point and then we've spoken to someone who's been, then given their opinion on it and we've had to sort of backtrack or change things um, which in the future we would sort of go we would know I think on a on a project this scale we would know that 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 would need to happen as of a lot earlier than it did for us um, in this situation. But um, yeah, something that's so so key and important to the success of it, um, and kind of I guess that thing of where you have to sort of sometimes when you put a lot of work into something, and then you just have to go no, nope, let's just rip it apart and start again and put it back together again, and it'll be better. Um, and that's sort of, yeah, I guess happened a few times um, in the process of this. But I think by the by the end of it, it will mean that what we've got and what we've made, it'll be um, kind of as, as good as it can be, hopefully. We're often talking about um, making as a thinking tool uh, and as an integral part of the design process. And you kind of touched upon it a little bit with um, the translator phones, uh, like the setup, just quickly whacking that together, see yeah. if it works. And then obviously it won't be in that configuration, but it's, it's, it's trialing these things out. And you also mentioned about feedback as well as getting things signed off about health and safety, which is obviously a heck of a, large part of design work and making as it were like you know if it's not going to pass risk assessment it, it, ultimately it can't go live so um so talking about these feedback loops and also how you um yeah just mentioned there about um maybe the consultation happens earlier in the process or maybe prototyping is quicker or making is quicker to get the response quicker um, yeah. I just, uh, yeah, I wondered if you could speak into that kind of making as a thinking tool as in, in kind of integral to the, the process, but also those those vital feedback loops, get something out there, get feedback and that prototype cycle. Yeah, I think that's kind of like, I think it's something that we've kind of from the very early days and I think maybe comes from a kind of theatre mentality of get something in front of an audience sort of don't necessarily worry about if it's going to work or if there's a way of um, a way of kind of mocking something up really quickly um, to see how people respond to it get it in front of the people that are going to ultimately experience it and then kind of shape it from there so um, yeah I guess that's something that we kind of we had this sort of phrase at the beginning action over discussion when we were first making work which was um, just you can kind of get caught up in talking about something and actually when you start doing it it starts to look quite different to the kind of the concept of it and there are nuances or elements that come out of that that um, you might not have ever thought of or realized were there um, and then I think something else that we kind of learned from the work that we've done over the years with the pervasive media studio is the way the kind of the approach to using technology in a sort of really sort of rough and ready hands-on way so that um often if, if you can mock something up by just on your laptop when when somebody moves something you just press play ultimately you'll have some fancy sensor that does that for you but there are there's normally a way that you can kind of replicate it to to see if it's going to work um and i guess that's sort of to a point with the with that first prototype that was a slightly further down the road than than that but it was kind of going well let's just give someone this kind of tupperware box with a load of tech in it and just see what happens um and i guess that's 
yeah that's a kind of it's yeah you have to be sort of brave enough I suppose to 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 do that so that you don't um I don't I guess there's a tendency to want to sort of finish things and make them look um mm. polished and um also being kind of open to the fact that they might just not work and you have to accept that that might not be the solution even though that's what you you thought it was going to be before going into making making the prototype but i think that's such a valuable lesson actually uh y you know the the value of the prototype uh and i love that just putting stuff in a tupperware box and seeing if it works just because uh you know and i guess working with our theater designers uh at wimbledon we're we're uh you know working together to try and get that making process as 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 soon as possible like you say because if you spend six weeks designing and then you hit the workshops in your last two weeks you, you, and then realize it's not going to work um you, you you're almost scuppered um what i love about your trajectory is um you know there's almost a starting point within a sculptural discipline and then this love of the artifacts you know the, the kind of collecting these meaningful objects and the family records and then trying to work with that in some way that um unleashes the storytelling which is an amazing you know it's kind of immediately there's so much potential there and I just wondered if you could share a little bit about you know your connection to materiality connection to you know even though these are all very interactive and stand instead as you know really specializes in these interactive design elements but actually there is a sense that um, you're using analog tools and digital tools fairly equally or integrated in some way so I just wondered if you could like share a little bit about your love of the artifacts and that research in the archive and bringing uh, an object to life um, and then also just your connection or your use of like analog and digital tools integrated in order to, to create these amazing experiences yeah I mean it's always been I guess yeah from kind of very early on that idea of the kind of importance of the object and the history of that and the kind of I guess a lot of we've done a lot of work as well with um in care homes with older people and the sort of there's something that kind of particularly with people with dementia the idea of something that's tactile or that has a smell to it or that uses all your senses um that's definitely kind of a, a thread I guess that has um it just crops up again and again even if we don't sort of mean it to and i guess within the generation wild project it's that thing of kind of wanting it to feel like it's connected to to nature um even though there is technology and all sorts of things behind that um and i think i guess another thing that we've sort of been interested in is that sort of the idea that we talk about technology and actually we, sort of often what we mean is digital technology and I think we sort of forget that all the technologies from the past so the printing press or um, dyeing or whatever it is all these other technologies are sort of equal in a way digital technology is just another one of those elements that can be kind of thrown into the mix and it's kind of I think sometimes people can be sort of wowed by it and it can take the tech the digital technology can kind of take over and actually we'd always rather people come away from our, an experience of ours talking about the story or the content rather than sort of how clever the the sort of technical setup was um it's sort of i suppose for us it's a kind of a means to an end um and i an example i guess of that which we really liked was when we were doing when we were designing the mayfly journals um, so we were spending a lot of time looking at image recognition and kind of app design and how we could kind of um, produce the digital element of it but we spent equally as much time researching british made papers and this very particular detailed dye stamp technique that you could only have done in scotland which meant that we could have a very fine mayfly illustration turned into a kind of um raised stamp that um for us it felt like in a way that process of researching those things was very similar and they they ultimately the the combination of the two were what made that 
that project for us really special because it was kind of giving equal weight to those things um and i guess yeah it's sort of more and more the more digital people become in a way the more sort of people i think long for those um those sort of more tactile experiences um but without sort of disregarding either either one mm. i love that that there's an equal uh, equality uh with all these technologies and actually when you prize one over the other or if there's an imbalance of uh, or being wowed by particularly one technology we 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 don't see the value of other technologies really um and there's some we we've been doing these talks recently called making making sense making literacies and i think something came up uh, running through those talks is making as research as connection as uh, conduits for lots of other things and of course in in certainly in your practice we can see making takes the shape of such a variety um, of different outputs as it were but essentially there's this kind of making as research which seems to underpin the practice um, i wondered um story is looks like a really important part or you know it's one of the core sort of anchors that you you're hanging practice on um, and uh, the navigation of that story the navigation of the narrative which i think is wonderful from like seeing your starting point in sculpture to like these immersive environments uh, to immersive theater and then to these kind of interactive experiences that can be done physically or or, or in a blended space online and I just wondered like if you could maybe share about some of your thoughts about making's role in the navigation of story. Yeah, I suppose it's sort of, yeah, it's a thread that kind of goes way back into the, I guess this idea of, a, um, I mean, one of the things, so I've, I've worked very closely um, with Lucy, who is a, play has she trained as a playwright and creative writing so that kind of element of story um has kind of is very much kind of um part of our work with stand and stare but is also i guess crosses over with with my interests but um what we've always been interested in is the idea of um how you can kind of disrupt or um distribute a narrative so that um a story doesn't necessarily have to have the same kind of uh shape although there are elements that you need so you you, you need a kind of a bit a beginning a middle and an end but you can often kind of jumble those things up or you can do different things with that in the way that kind of memory often works in that things aren't necessarily chronological but there's a sort of a sense that gets made um and i suppose that's something that we started with the sort of immersive theater and then into the theatre jukebox, so the idea of these cards, um, and and I suppose spanning both kind of a fictional narrative, um, so something that we've made up, like the Ava story, um, or a, another big side of the work that we do is working with um, historical archives and um, uh, using material that's existing, but to um, sort of uh, I guess distribute that or kind of work that out in a way that kind of makes sense or is a is a new narrative um more more similar i suppose to say kind of documentary making um so yeah i suppose um stories and narrative um crop up in all sorts of different ways and um and and i guess yeah we've sort of moved from going i, I guess from stories that we've made up to then stories that we've kind of retold through history and then through to sort of Mayfly, which is a platform then for other people to kind of add their stories to and to, to make them themselves. So yeah, in all sorts of ways, that's kind of a thread that runs through, through everything mm. that we do. And you mentioned something about people management, which is great because, um, you know, I should imagine with immersive theatre, it could be like herding cats in some shapes, you know, in, in some senses. Um, but yeah, I wondered if you could share a little bit about your trajectory from moving from more like theatre environments uh, to the work that you're doing now in terms of engagement. 
Yeah, I think it's kind of, I suppose it, in a way, it's that idea of interaction design. So how do you design? And that might be, that might be an app, or it might be a piece of immersive theater, or it might be an installation, but it's kind of like going, I'm going to put myself in the, in the shoes of every, every different person in every situation that might happen and try and design this experience so that it works and that it's a pleasant one. It's not mm-hmm. confusing. And, um, and sometimes that's, it's often when you do it, when it works, it looks really straightforward and simple. Um, like the idea of putting the postcard on the table, just the, the subtlety of like what words you choose, um, how you frame it, um, all those sorts of things are kind of like, they have to be stuff that's kind of intuitive um and i suppose yeah designing that experience is something that um i think to begin with we didn't sort of realize we were even doing it and i think kind of as we've progressed we've realized that um that that's something when it works it it's it's integral and when it doesn't work it gets in the way of everything else that you've done because if someone if someone can't hear or they can't see or they get lost or they're worried that they've missed something that can really sort of I guess damage their their overall experience of something so it's yeah it's being kind of um it's being aware of all those things um so that you can um yeah make make the best experiences that you can yeah and it comes down yeah and like you say it comes down to that interaction desire and that you know, almost creating the environment or the tools or the structure for people to then engage in the storytelling and but I, it's such a wonderful kind of expansive trajectory to then be offering that structure almost as an open source for people then to kind of add and contribute to um We've just got one last question, Barney, and then we'll we'll probably call it time there. But um, uh, Chris is just asking about funding, which I think is quite a um, it's quite a key point to these um, projects, isn't it? In terms, that's almost a part of the making aspect in itself. Um, so uh, the question is, how easy is this project? Uh, how was it? Um, how easy? Uh, was this project to get funding and did the feedback loop help this in terms of how you I, I guess went about getting feedback um, but yeah I just wondered if you had you know obviously you've had over 10 years of um, experience uh, in this field and funding must come from a, a, a myriad of different ways yeah I mean it's a big part of what we do is basically yeah so some there has been times where we've it's it feels like all you're doing is applying for things mm. um and I think what what we found is that um what's kind of kept us going through some of the more difficult times is being kind of flexible, so we've done quite a lot of academic collaborations where there is kind of money that comes through a university so we've done a lot with Bristol University um, and that's kind of often kind of research and a bit more experimental we've done things where we've say applied for an arts council grant for a project that a person a project that we want to kind of run um, we have um, also then projects like this one which is a kind of where we uh, basically uh, there was a tender process so WWT um, decided that they wanted to make an experience that engages children and families from disadvantaged backgrounds they put together a um, a, a kind of applica- a call out um, and through the kind of our networks they um, got in touch with us to see if we would be interested in in tendering for it and then there was quite a kind of a lengthy process of initially doing a um, an expression of interest and then doing a, a more detailed plan of some of the more creative elements of it and then an interview and then finally we were lucky enough to be the successful company to to do it but we have been through that process and at any stage of that you might not be kind of chosen to take forward so there's a sort of yeah there's a risk involved in 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 kind of uh, in applying for something like that um, and if you don't feel like you're quite kind of like with this project we needed to make sure we had all of the 
kind of back end stuff so, so financial uh, we needed to be able to prove that we could we had all the right insurance and we had the right accounting systems and we had the right project management stuff to make to make it work as well as all of the creative ideas so um yeah i guess in terms of funding it's um i mean the f so the funding for this generation wild project and that was, uh, I think it came from a charity. So it was donated to WWT. So they have a pot of money that um, they have kind of said, you can use this proportion of it to design the experience. There's a whole other lot of things to do with um, the paying for coaches and all the sorts of things that they have to do over the, the, the three years. But um, yeah, it does, it, it varies and it is a big, element of what we do is sort of working out um how to how to pay for it yeah i mean it's phenomenal <laughs> i mean phenomenal that is uh I, the, yeah the, i mean that we that could almost deem a whole nother talk isn't it in terms of <laughs> in, terms, <laughs> in terms of how you uh, access uh, funding in in some ways um uh, uh chris just says i absolutely love your work for so many reasons bringing loads of different art and technical art mediums together to expand minds whilst bringing families and communities together brilliant thank you for your time and knowledge um oh, and that's you. that is uh yeah exactly true and a, a great way to uh, kind of sign off and just say thank you so much for your time in prep i know hopefully this is what helpful for you in in the moment of delivering this massive project um hopefully there was you know a, a good moment in um of reflection of just all that phenomenal achievement um and uh yeah just want to say thank you for your time and prep for today but also in our conversations um before today and also to lucy for you know releasing you to uh come come and chat to us today we really appreciate it um yeah thank you so much bonnie um cool it's been a really good time. Um, on that note, uh, it's just to say, um, do catch up on our uh, previous uh, sessions on our blog page and follow us. Uh, and do follow Stand and Stare as well. Um, their details are on our blog so, uh, and, and on our Instagram. So do go see those if you can.